Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the fourth uh, edition of the Deep Reinforcement Learning Portfolio Optimization uh, Series. So all of this data, as I mentioned in every single video, is in this repo, so please go and have a look. And this is a very dense uh, video in particular, so I would highly recommend you go back and have a look at those first three videos um, so you kind of can follow along here. I'm going to jump right in, and like I say, in one of the previous videos, we started up a, an instance. One of the things to note here is that this is just a tiny one. Uh, I think in the last video, or in the um, second video, we started a much larger instance. This is just a small, tiny one, because in, in this one, we're going to spin off uh, the more expensive jobs from here. Now, the other thing is when you set up, you have to make sure that you list the repo uh, in the setup of the instance. That way, every time you launch it, it'll go to the uh, repo and clone the latest set. I've already got mine up and running, so I just need to click Open Jupyter. You may have to start yours if you haven't been running it for a while. Uh, so now you can see we actually have a new uh, a Jupyter Notebook here. It's this one. And actually, before we jump in, I'm just going to open up the, all of the source uh, files are in here as well. I'm just going to open up a few. We'll come back and we'll uh, look through them in a second. Uh, we can also see that the... Uh, price data and the signals that we generated in the last one is sitting here as well. So when we push this all off into a new uh, compute node, this whole folder gets sent over there. And so it'll be there for us to read. Um, okay, and so let me open up this one. I guess before we get started, I did want to kind of give a little shout out uh, to Professor uh, Yelena Yularkin and uh, Shulik for allowing me to kind of uh, spend some time. This is actually three separate uh, half credit courses. Uh, that I've done independent studies uh, for uh, my MBA. So uh, very appreciative of the, uh, the freedom to go in and uh, uh, investigate this uh, intersection of machine learning and finance. Uh, I'd also like to shout out to the Cloud Guru. Uh, I did a bunch of training here to kind of prepare for this. Uh, they've got some great content there. I certainly recommend them. And also, as I think mentioned in previous examples, in here AWS has a suite of um, example uh, notebooks. Uh, and these are all reinforcement learning. Obviously, I looked through a lot of this. A lot of that's in this particular uh, notebook is heavily uh, taken from there and referenced, of course. So with that, uh, I guess one last thing is that there's actually three different uh, frameworks that are used here. So I didn't write this from scratch. Uh, there's pros and cons of that. Uh, pro is that it's very quick to get up and running. The con is that it's very difficult, as I'll mention in a little bit, to kind of um, customize it, especially for us where we're in a... A uh, very unique sort of application. Uh, it works really well if you're doing things like, so if we go into this one for a quick second, there are a full suite of, um, you know, different types of environments you can run. And like, so for instance, a video game, this, the rules of the video game always are static. So they don't change. So once you kind of train and machine learning algorithms to do that, it'll always be the same. Even something like this, it's physics. So once it kind of learns the physics, it's always the same physics. Uh, chess, same sort of thing. The, the rules of chess doesn't change. However, one thing we have is that our environment, the rules of the game in the financial analysis keeps changing. So it's something where we can't train a model and then just use that trained model for the next two years. We have to constantly keep retraining the model uh, and that's something that this particular framework doesn't do very well, so I'll speak to that in a bit. Uh, maybe something that I definitely want to upgrade when we go further. Uh, the other thing is the um, uh, agent that we build, the kind of freedom and the flexibility that you want to uh, use here, uh, we just don't have it with the framework. So this is the uh, file that kind of sets up the framework. Don't worry about the, the nitty-gritty details. But the main thing to kind of take away is that they just have kind of embedder in the front which we set here as a convolutional um, neural net, a CNN. Uh, this is the CON 2D. Um, and then a middleware, which kind of you can just have a single layer. Um, I certainly would like to build up something that's a lot more complex than that to get a lot more nuance from the, the data, um, but you can't kind of do it with this framework. So if you want to get into a more complicated agent, you certainly would have to kind of move past these built-in uh, frameworks. But again, fantastic, get up and running really fast. Lots of examples there. It'll kind of get you moving. So um, this is the basic uh, reinforcement learning feedback loop that we've shown. It's discussed a bunch in this particular uh, report. So the agent here is effectively, you know, this is the speculator, the person doing the trades. They're reading the state. So this is all of those signals that we developed. Uh, so it kind of looks at where we are today. And then based on that, 
they'll make some action and the actions for us will simply be your desired uh, portfolio weighting. That gets passed into the environment. And from that, of course, you get calculated a reward. So now this is why we kind of needed that extra time step. Uh, remember from last video, because the reward is how much it has changed your, the um, individual stock prices have changed from today to yesterday. And based on your, um, your weighting, that gives you your portfolio and your change in the portfolio. And then of course the state is, it just goes and pulls that data from that CSV that we sent to kind of pass what the state looks like uh, in the following day. So I'm not gonna get into too much detail. It's all here you can kind of read. Uh, the one thing I just wanted to, to, to note was, you know, again, that RL Coach has a full suite of different AI or um, RL algorithms out there. It's a pretty awesome set. Uh, it gives you a chance to kind of try different ones. In the report, we talked about the DTBG, uh, the, determin the Deep Deterministic Policy Gradient Actor Critic Method. Here we're going with a different actor critic method, the PPO, uh, Proximal Policy Optimization. Uh, looking at a lot of the literature, it certainly seems to be something that uh, shows a lot of promise. So we tried to try it here. Um, as I mentioned here, the tweaks that I, I kind of say, some of the limitations uh, that we have, the fact that we have to kind of go through that uh, set up infrastructure. Uh, and the environment as well, this is probably the area where we kind of add the most value, if you will, from um, you know, a finance perspective. Uh, the All those algorithms we're showing here, you know, this is a whole field of study. I don't think we're going to kind of make this um, advance this field, but really how we interact with the financial data, I think that's really where it comes through. And again, I kind of pulled up in pie charts. I have it there for everyone to look at if they don't want to look at pie chart, but it's a little easier on the eyes. So this is really where we kind of say how, um, what sort of rewards do we want to send back? And so really when we step in the environment, this is kind of where we calculate the rewards uh, we put in any sort of costs of trading, uh, all those types of things we can kind of put in here. This is certainly something that we could evolve uh, as well as the signals. So I think the signals and this bit of code here is probably the main area where we could kind of change and tweak. Um, you could add in different um, penalties and rewards for risk, that type of thing. This would go in this area of the code. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, and this is just reading the, uh, the CSV files that we set up. So just a little setup we're gonna get in here. One of the things, uh, I couldn't find a great picture of this. I almost made one myself, but um, when we're running a, a SageMaker notebook, we're on a particular instance, a very light, cheap notebook. I'm getting charged for this instance right now, but it's a very, very small charge, fractions of a cent uh, per hour, so it, it's a nothing charge. Um, but you really wanna do all your heavy lifting in a much more expensive uh, piece of architecture or piece of inf or, um, hardware. And so what we do is we have an S3 bucket, which is kind of, it's a simple storage system where you can store things. And that's kind of where you would communicate with that higher, that compute node. So here we're kind of just setting up the paths to that. And this is kind of the S3 is kind of like HTTP. It's, you know, kind of like, it's not exactly the same, but similar is kind of an address that you can connect to. This is the bucket that we're going to connect to. And then within the bucket, you can have folders. So this just shows a particular checkpoint folder that we have set up. But it's also where when you send stuff to um, the compute node, it will go and move it over to that S3 bucket. And then when it spins up a new instance to compute, it reads from that S3 bucket. So that's just a little bit of information there about how, it, how AWS works behind the hood. So the other thing that we kind of said here is I wanted to see which type of instance would be good. That's a question we always have. And it always changes depending on your job, how big your architecture is, where all of the uh, bottlenecks are. And so for us, the P's are actually the GPUs. And in the previous one, the GPUs were blazingly fast. But here you can see the time. And um, this was for 60,000 steps and no uh, middleware uh, network. Uh, I think I mentioned here, at the end of the day, I did go put in a, a dense... Uh, this is like a, just a straight up fully connected feed forward uh, net in between. Uh, but when I did my pricing, I didn't do that. Uh, you can see that the speeds didn't go with the GPU. It was actually the compute intensive node that was the fastest. Um, and this one, even though it was a little bit cheaper, and then of course each of these have a different price per hour. So you can see still super small. So to do this training I'm about to, that I kick off, uh, we're only talking cents. So I picked this one, it took cost me about six cents every time I trained it, uh, which of course I did several times. Um, and the cheapest was three, but I paid the extra three cents for an extra minute of my time. 
So this is where you set up the, the um, estimator itself. Uh, a lot of this stuff you kind of don't have to worry about. There's just the frameworks that we're using. Um, we're only going to use one compute instance because we're just going to do it single. We're not, we could do multiple and do batches, but we're just going to do a single instance and the instance type, uh, where we want things put to. And then uh, also this is like the source, right? So it tells it to go, when you go and spin up this job, grab everything in the source directory and move it over to that S3 bucket. Uh, and then some hyperparameters that we use during the training. So the discount factor, you know, the rewards, you want to dis that them as you go through in the, in the, the future. And the main one that you might want to tweak is this, is your training steps. So how many training steps you want to do all together. So, and it's all together. So for instance, in this one, every single, we start every training at a randomly selected date. So it's not starting at the same date all the time. It randomly selects a date to start and then it goes for two years. So it sees how well this particular policy worked on a two year kind of time horizon. And then based on that, it'll tweak the parameters, go back and try another two years try another two years, try another two years. Uh, each two years is uh, 506 days. So, you know, this one's 100,000. 100,000 divided by 506 is kind of the number of training cycles that we'll actually go and try. And it does the full 100,000, then the next time it comes back, it'll stop if it's greater than this 100,000 limit. So that's basically what it's gonna do. We actually just say fit. This is literally tells it to go off. Then after it's fit, so we can see down here, I've already pre-baked this one. It starts a job, launches it, starts up that instance that we have, downloads everything you know from here over to the instance um, because the instance itself has its own local storage. So it has to, the instance has to go grab it. Um, and then the image, so that's literally what type of, when they say image, what's the OS, what's the type of frameworks that it needs. It goes and grabs all the information, downloads it, spins it up, and then starts running it. And when it's finished, we bring all that data back from the training and we just unpack it. Don't worry about this too much. It just basically takes a compressed file, brings it to our local directory, unpacks it. And then we're going to just do a couple of plots. First thing we plot is the um, rewards. So this is the sum of the rewards on every episode. So I mentioned that an episode is 506 days long. So it's on each of these two year windows how much was your reward, the cumulative reward. And so obviously this is what you want to train. If you're below zero, that basically means you are losing money. So when we first started up the training, you know, it would constantly be losing money. So our portfolio would be shrinking over time. Uh, but as it trained, and you can see here, we probably could have kept training um, and got a little better. Uh, well, all we had to do was just jack up this number here for the number of approved steps. That'll make it train for longer. And here we can see our results and we can see you know, thankfully we did better than the market value. And so the market value would be just if we grabbed our portfolio equally uh, distributed across the stocks and just kept it. So that's the size of our portfolio. And then this would be, um, of course, uh, where we change the weights on every single day. Uh, and of course, it probably learns not to trade every single day or not a lot every day because there is um, costs associated with training. So you can see here, we certainly kind of, in this area, we probably had a biggest gap and we kind of started losing a bit, to be honest, uh, relative to the market right here. But overall, over the two year period, uh, we beat the market, which is of course fantastic. So the one last thing I, I want to say here is, um, one was I kind of didn't like how the, uh, the fact that the architecture that we're using is a pretty simple actor. So it just had that scene at the beginning, which takes a bit of time history. Right, so it, it CNNs are usually used for images, but you can still look at for time history, and so you kind of have a 1D image. And so each signal is like an image, and you are just trying to pull patterns. And so it's a very small one, it's just seven days. So it's looking for a little bit of uh, trend in that, that data. And then all of the, and then it's also across not just the stock data, but all of the signals that we fed it in. All right, it's looking at the seven day history. And then that middle layer was very small. So it's, it wasn't very complex, a single layer. Probably want to make it a little more complex. But the main issue here is, and if this is a function of uh, the type of environment we're working in, the fact that our environment's constantly changing. So I couldn't train this model for 10 years and then use the model for the following two because the, you know, the rules of the game would, would change. And that's one of the things I noticed uh, in the example here and in the papers, they weren't doing this normal, you know, training versus uh, testing uh, split. And I think the main reason that is because you kind of had to learn as you go. So the way to do this proper would be to train it a bunch, 
over a period. But then, and you know, how you'd use it in the real world is that every day you would retrain. So you should never see, you know, the, you don't know what tomorrow will bring. So you're not cheating because you, you know, you're not kind of looking into the future. Um, but you want to keep retraining to kind of keep learning. I, I liken this too, if you had a trader that came into school, did stuff for a couple of years and then stopped learning. And then for the next two years, didn't learn a thing and just, you know, kind of just played the same system. Uh, that wouldn't be a very effective uh, uh, strategy. And so I think one of the things we really want to build up is this ability to train, save the model weights, get more data, make an action, and then retrain. And so you almost need a loop of training where every single time you train, you just progress the date one. So you get one extra day into your data set and then retrain. It only takes, you know, minutes to retrain. So in real life, it, you know, that seems like a very... Uh, realistic thing. However, the reason why I haven't done it here is that when I do this training, I don't have a way to, what you would need to do is save the weights in that actor. So in that neural net, if there's a set of weights for every single node, I would need to save those weights from the training. And then when I restart the training with an initial day and with another day added, go and push those weights in and start. Unfortunately, if I restart this now and rerun, I start back here. So I don't have a way to kind of train um, a model starting with a, a pre-built in this particular architecture. That's something you do often. You know, this is kind of almost like a transfer learning issue, um, but this is something we would do normally. Uh, but just with this particular architecture, I can't figure out a way to push in model weights in through here. Because again, it's not the, the, train, the RL trainer. If we go back to all these frameworks here, uh, we have this RL coach. We have the SageMaker interface. SageMaker has to pass the information into RL coach, and the RL coach passes it into the Apache MXNet because that's really where the agent is. This is where the neural net sits. So there's several layers we have to go through, and I couldn't figure out a way to kind of pass those weights through that net. Now, there may be a way. I simply couldn't find it. Um, I think it would be easier, to be honest, is to um, probably pull out the coach and have your net direct that way kind of pull out that layer but that's certainly uh forward work here we've kind of set up a system uh we can try different algorithms very simple to switch algorithms um it's a single file to switch it out we can try different signals i think that's and you look at where we could add value i think it's looking at new signals so i want to go back try to get different things different uh, you know, sentiment analysis is one that people always talk about. What happens when you add sentiment analysis in there? We only have 10 stocks. What happens when you add more stocks to that? So I think there's a lot of, lot of uh, room for future growth in developing the signals alone and just using this infrastructure as is. Um, we could also try different algorithms. Um, but I would say another big infrastructure piece that I would do, the next one, would be changing how it trains. So right now, every time we go in, we're constantly starting at a different date, a random date, uh, and training the environment. So it's got a, you know, it's it's not learning the history because it's starting at a different spot all the time. Uh, but still, it's not a nice, clean way where it's simply never, ever seen that particular data. And we want to see how quickly it could, as the set of rules change and you add additional data and it retrains, how quickly can it adapt? Uh, I think that would be an excellent uh, next step in this project. Uh, with that, I think that's it. Like I say, we have a system up and running. Um, it, uh, doing the back testing, it is beats the market, which is always, you know, the, the first lowest bar to clear. Um, I think there's still more training to do. We could certainly make a, a, a denser network. Um, I would definitely, next steps, try different signals. And the next step would also be to change how this training process happens. With that, uh, thank you for your time and uh, hopefully we'll talk to you later.